lecture on Roman military colonialism. And I'm going to split the lecture up into two parts. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, the Roman military itself, talk a little bit about uh, their equipment, uh, a little bit about their uh, hierarchy and divisions. And the second part, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what it meant when Rome went to colonize other places or conquer other nations, what happened to those people, and how it all turned out uh, in terms of the Roman uh, being. So, to start with, the Roman military is responsible for the colonization, development, and conquests of Rome. Um, and this military facilitates the expansion of the empire, and most importantly, the economic relationships. And we'll study some of those a little bit later. Um, there are a lot of features that the Roman army will actually have in common with the US military and militaries around the world. And there are several advantages to becoming a Roman citizen. And we'll look at those uh, in detail as well. Well, first, in the Roman military, we're going to talk about the equipment that they use, um, the divisions that they're separated into, as well as their tactics and some parallels uh, to the US. So the first thing I'd like to talk about, and I know Dr. Paff has actually mentioned some of this in his lecture, but we're going to take a look at some of the Roman armor. So lorica is the word for armor in Roman times. And they're going to have several different types. Um, the three types of Roman armor that we'll encounter are the lorica segmentata, the lorica squamata, and the lorica hamata. We'll also look at the Roman scutum and the helm. Um, first is the lorica segmentata. And segmentata meant segmented plate. So you'd have large plates of iron that would be uh, put together into a suit of armor. Um, this is very similar uh, to later on, you might have knights in plate mail, but this was its uh, predecessor. So the segmentata with these large plates that were segmented to allow movement, free, freedom of movement so you could fight with them. And you can notice uh, it's the, the soldier could actually bend and move their arms uh, and be unencumbered, so they'd still be able to, to fight with this. Um, the segmentata gave very good protection. It gave protection against um, both the cut uh, and the blow, and also gave protection, uh, some modest protection against the thrust. So it was a very uh, heavy armor, uh, expensive, made of iron, and only the more wealthy soldiers could afford it. This armor was probably the last one uh, to come in place in the Roman Empire. But before this, we had some other armors. The Lor Lorica Squamata, for example. This is what we call scale mail armor. And you're going to notice, if you look at the picture up on the left, we have several scales, like a fish, like a fish's scales, that are woven together. And these are small pieces of metal. And they're woven together into a male shirt, like we see the gentleman on the right wearing. Now, this is all made of metal as well. And you'll find that this is going to give some protection as well, but not as much as the segmentata. One of the benefits to the squamata is it's going to give some protection, but the movement is actually going to be a lot easier. You're going to see that these small scales are going to bend with you a little bit easier than the large plates of the segmentata. Uh, last, we have the lorica hamata. And the lorica hamata is sort of the early version of chainmail. These are very tightly woven together iron rings. And they would put these rings together in a certain pattern and create uh, male shirts. So you can see the pattern of the rings here on the left. And you can see some of the male shirts that the gentlemen on the right are wearing. This was a little bit different than the chain mail of, of knights in the medieval period. It was a little closely woven together. And you'll also find that the male shirts they have really just cover the torso. Um, the knightly hauberks that we're used to seeing in uh, Knights of King Arthur tend to come down to just below the knees and tend to cover more of the arm. Here, the Roman soldiers only cover the important areas, that being the chest and groin. Okay, here we can see some close-ups of the Lorica Hamata. 
and you can see how the, the rings are fastened closely together. And we can see, again, how it's going to cover the torso and groin area. So those are the areas that you want to protect to stay alive. Now, the Lorica Hamata is an earlier form of armor, and you're going to find that with this armor, it's going to protect really well against the cut. So if someone tries to slash you with their sword, it's going to protect you very well. But if someone tries to thrust and tries to impale you with a sword or a spear, it's actually not very good at defending against that, and it will, it will puncture. Um, so the segmentata was the preferred armor. Uh, the hamata was a little bit more comfortable. Um, you can move around in it a lot better, but it did not provide as adequate as protection. Um, the scatum, this is the Roman word for shield. And the scatum was the, really the backbone of the Roman army. Um, they all fought together in a shield wall, shield to shield. So the, the, uh, fighter, uh, the fighter would protect themselves with the shield and also the person to their left. So this was very important. Um, if a shield went down, it provided an opening for which the enemy could exploit. So you wanted to fight shield to shield, protect each other. Um, sort of like if you take a look at modern day football, uh, you have blockers in the front, and if there's a hole in the blocking scheme, um, a defender can get through and sack the quarterback. Very similar to Roman times, you would fight shield to shield and not let any openings. Okay, uh, here we can see a bunch of Romans with their shields, and you can see them shield to shield. Okay, not letting any openings through, so no enemies can get past. Okay, the helmets. Um, here's a simple helmet, and we can see that these are made of iron as well. In the beginnings, they may have been made of bronze. Um, we also see that they've got some cheek plates that'll hang down to protect the face, and they'll be attached by a string on the bottom to keep them tight. Um, additionally, the Romans may have worn an arming cap, which is simply um, maybe a cloth headpiece to keep the helmet inside tight, and so they could actually have it uh, attached to their head and not fall off and stay on straight. Um, what would normally happen then is a lot of the officers of the Roman army uh, would decorate their helmets with uh, dyed horse hair or feathers. And this was a denotion of rank, and so they could be recognized on the battlefield. So you wanted to see who your officers were on the battlefield, so often they would decorate their, their heads with plumes. Um, the centurions, who were in charge of the centuries, they were the head officers, and they would often decorate their helmets in a horizontal fashion. So if you can notice, this guy almost has a sort of a mohawk with his plume. We can see the centurions, their decorations will go horizontally. This is so they can be instantly recognized on the battlefield. You knew who the leader was, you knew who the leader of your century was, and you could rally behind him. So he's instantly recognizable. Um, we see the centurion on the left here, who's wearing the Lorica Hamata, and we see the centurion on the right, who's wearing the Lorica Segmentata. Okay, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Roman weaponry now. Um, the Romans used a variety of weapons. I'm not going to go through all of them today, but I'm going to show you a couple of them, just to illustrate some points. Um, first is that the Romans were masters of warfare uh, and defeated their enemies, and they used a lot of strategy and science behind this. One was that they were able to strike at multiple distances. So while your army was assembling, Roman would hit you with uh, long-distance weapons, being the scorpion and the onager, and then be able to assail you with medium-range weapons, the asta and the pilum, and then finally, at short range, whatever was left of your army would be finished off with the gladius. So let's go through each of them briefly. Uh, the scorpion, also known as the Scorpio or the ballista. I like to call this a crossbow on steroids. Um, this is sort of like a, a crossbow that would be manned by two people, and it was capable of shooting uh, large bolts. So if you thought, uh, if anybody has shot a bow and arrow before, how many people shot a bow and arrow? Okay, and you know that the arrow is maybe this big. Well, imagine shooting an arrow this big and having the arrow be made out of iron. Well, this arrow could shoot very long range and it could go through any type of armor and any type of shield. So at very long range, before you could even attack your enemy, you're already being hit by these. 
So this was good for psychological effect. Um, it also made the enemy advance a little sooner than they, maybe they'd want to. Um, it was also deadly accurate. For being such a big machine and firing these large bolts, um, you could actually pick out a person, aim and shoot and hit them. Um, they were very accurate. Um, as we see here, it takes uh, two Roman soldiers to operate it. And they came in various different shapes and sizes. Um, they were large engines. You could shoot multiple bolts at uh, one time if you wanted to. And this is the Roman scorpion, Scorpio, or Bellista. You could call it either one. Next is the onager. The onager is a torsion-based catapult. And I know Dr. Paff touched on this a little bit. Um, but the onager uh, would be more of a siege-type engine. So if you wanted to launch uh, an attack against a fortification, for example, uh, the onager could be loaded with large stones, and so you could pelt someone's walls down. Or if they had a, some sort of wooden fortification, you could knock down that wooden fortification with large stones. Um, but you could also arm it with um, any sort of flaming object. So uh, objects uh, doused with flaming oil, for example, and you could create incendiary attacks. Um, this would cause a lot of panic and destruction. So the onager, again, a long-range weapon. Next we come to the medium-range weapons. Uh, this is the asta. And the asta is a long spear, and there are a couple types. There's the asta and the asta pura. And the asta pura, meaning pure spear, uh, would be simply a, a wooden shaft that has been sharpened. So you could simply have the wood sharpened on the end. However, most Romans used uh, an iron spearhead on the end of the asta. Now the asta is used for a couple different reasons. One, it is a stabbing weapon. You can take this very long spear with strong wood and stab at your opponent. Um, but another reason you use the asta was to repel cavalry. So what Romans would often do is they would take the asta and they would take the, the butt end and they would dig it into the earth. And after they dug it into the earth, they would go down in a stance. And any horses that approached them would have to impale themselves on the spears if they wanted to engage you. So anytime uh, Rome was engaged by cavalry, they had a defense mechanism against it. And they would simply go down on their astas and um, defend them. And that would be your front row of spearmen while people in the back uh, assailed them with missile weapons, such as the pilum, the javelins, uh, bows and arrows, etc. Speaking of the pilum, uh, the pilum is the Roman heavy javelin. Um, they had lighter javelins as well, but the pilum is a really signature weapon of the Roman army. And if you can look on the right, the pilum is a very customizable weapon. Um, it is made half of wood and half of iron. And you're going to notice at the very tip, um, the tip of the pilum is a barb. This is for a couple reasons. The main one being the pilum was not just used as a javelin to uh, kill your enemies. This was actually a preemptive weapon and part of the Roman strategy. What you would do is you would go out and you would throw your pila, which is the plural of pilum, you would throw your pila at the enemy's shields. Now once you got this, uh, this spear stuck in your shield, you'll notice since it's barbed, it's not going to come out very easily. And because the second half of this weapon is made of iron, you're not going to be able to take your sword and cut it off very easily either. So you have a couple choices. One, you can walk forward with your shield with a seven foot spear stuck in it, which is going to severely hinder your mobility, or you can throw your shield away. And when Rome did this, they, cr they created holes in the shield line. And those holes could be exploited later on and the Roman army would defeat you. Um, it was primarily a throwing weapon and we can see that it is customizable, so you could, um, the one on the left, for example, would be more for uh, throwing at people, whereas the one on the right would be more used for impaling a shield. And we can see it's used as a throwing weapon. Um, we can see also on the end, sometimes there's a butt spike, and we could see a, uh, an iron uh, point on the end of it. And this helps for uh, attacks as well, but also helps for helping dig into the earth in case you needed to dig your pilum into the earth to repel cavalry as well. And here we got a picture of a bunch of uh, Romans throwing the pilum. Uh, 
Okay, last but not least, the short-range weapon, uh, the gladius. And the gladius is the Roman word for sword. So if we think of another word that sounds like gladius, um, the word gladiator. Okay, so gladiator simply meant swordsman. And, of course, we uh, equate it to the, uh, the Roman uh, prize fighter of the day. But gladius, gladiator, same thing, swordsman. So this is the Roman sword. Um, I actually have one here today. Um, this is a Roman gladius or a reproduction of one. And so I figured I'd bring it in and show it to you. Um, I teach music at St. Joseph's College here, but one of my other, uh, one of my other things is I'm, I'm one of less than 50 uh, uh, fencing masters in the United States, and I, I give uh, uh, lectures on swords quite a bit, so I thought I'd, I'd share this with you a little. Um, this is the gladius sword, and it's a very unique sword. First, you'll notice that it's rather short. It's not too long, is it? And you'll also notice that it's got a very unique shape to it. Um, you'll notice that there's no ornate handguard to it. Um, the guard of the sword is rather plain. The handle made of wood, the pommel made of wood, handle uh, sometimes wrapped in leather. And you notice it comes to a sharp point, and the blade itself kind of comes to a, a, a fullness here. There's, two points right here on the blade. If you can see, this is the thick part of the blade up at the top. Okay? And that is because um, it put the weight of the sword here. So if I needed to chop at something, it would come hard down. Ouch. It would come hard down right on that. All right? So you could actually take someone's hand off. Um, but it was also handy for if I needed to chop wood or forge through um, uh, the forest. Uh, I could actually use this as a tool as well. Now, uh, I'd like you guys to try something with me. Um, can I ask all of you to take your right hand? Okay, take your right hand, put it out in front of you like you're going to shake hands with somebody. Now, can I ask you all to imagine you're holding a sword and draw your sword? Ready? Go. Wonderful. Now, I noticed that almost all of you reached to your opposite hip to draw your sword and draw it out like that. And that's, that's how we normally do it. However, the Romans couldn't do it like that. In fact, when you see the Romans draw their swords, it was quite different. And the Romans could not wear their sword on their left hip. They had to wear it on their right hip. So they often wore it with a baldric like this across themselves. And in this position, um, they could draw the sword without getting in the way of the shield because the Roman shield is so important. They're going to fight with the shield in front of them. If I'm to pull the sword out here, it would run into the shield and I would not get it out of the sheath. So I couldn't draw it from the left hip. I'd have to draw it from my right hip. So in most of the pictures you see, you'll actually see the Romans having the sword on the right hip. If you see it on the left hip, it meant that the reenactor didn't do their homework. So how do you draw the sword out from your right hip? Well, everyone try this with me. Take your hand like you're going to shake hands with somebody. Now, take your thumb, point it up. Now, take your whole hand and rotate it down so your thumb is on the bottom. Now, take your hand and move it to your hip. This is how the Roman would have to draw their sword. It is a little weird. And with the shield in front of you, though, when I draw the sword now, you'll notice the point stays behind the shield, and now I'm ready to go. Okay. Once I draw the sword, and you're going to notice that as I make this draw, as I bring it out, it doesn't interfere with my friend, my neighbor next to me, does it? Okay. So I'm safe behind my shield. I haven't interfered with the people in the shield line. I'm able to get the weapon out correctly, and now I can attack. Now, the Roman gladius is generally a thrusting weapon. Okay. Um, the Romans found out that while the slash where the cut may wound you, the thrust will probably kill you. So this was the more effective weapon. Also, due to its shorter size, the Roman gladius uh, gave itself to the thrust. And with the shorter size, it could actually penetrate um, heavier armor. So 
when you thrust with the gladius, and if you all want to try this with me once, so take your right hand, okay? And let's put it out and hold your gladius. And when you thrust, you're going to thrust and put your knuckles on the top. Ready? Go. Okay, good. And why would you put your knuckles on the top? Well, if you can examine my blade, if I didn't have my knuckles on the top, this blade would go in like this, and it would get caught on your enemy's ribs. If I pronated my hand with the knuckles on the top, I could go between the ribs and probably kill my enemy. So uh, this is the gladius sword. Okay. okay. Organization of the legion. Well, the legion is their army. And the army consists of approximately 5,400 people. Um, now, I know in some of the other lectures that number may have differed. I know in, in, your, uh, in your readings that number may have differed. You have to understand that uh, the Roman army has been around for a very, very long time, and the numbers will change from time to time. So these numbers are approximate for a certain time period. But the legion will consist of 5,400 men, and in that legion we will have 10 cohorts. And each of the cohorts will have approximately 480 men. Each cohort will be divided into six centuries, and the centuries will have approximately 80 people, and it will be, in a century, we'll have 10 contraburnium. And the contraburnium is a group of eight soldiers. And this will give you sort of an idea of how um, well designed the Roman army was and how well organized they were. So much like um, in America, we are, we are uh, given divisions and brigades and platoons in our armies, um, they were broken down as such in the Roman army as well. So first, the legion. The legion is commanded by a legate. And this person is very similar to a general that we would have, or a field marshal. Okay? He's in charge of the whole group. Um, if there were multiple legions, uh, that would be commanded by a praetor. And the, leg the legate or the praetor um, was usually also the governor of that Roman province. Um, the junior officers of the legate are going to be tribunes and he'll usually have six of them. And the tribunes are going to be sort of like his colonels or his majors, and they will go out and they will command um, some of the cohorts, or they will stick by the legate and carry out his wishes. Okay, a cohort, uh, like I said, it's gonna be commanded by tribunes, um, but it can also be commanded by uh, the senior centurions. So um, the centurion who had like the most uh, uh, experience and rank might be given command of a cohort. Um, we would have a first centurion, or what they called a primus pilus, and that person would be in charge of the first cohort. And the first cohort would actually contain more people and probably the better fighters. So the first cohort was kind of an honor to be in. Centuries. Uh, Centuries are captained by a centurion and that's similar to a modern army captain. Um, they contained 80 men, although at some points in history they contained 100, so we get the, the term century. And even if they had 80 men, a lot of times they had other people with them that were not necessarily Roman soldiers. So sometimes they had people with them that would follow the army to help take care of, of baggage uh, uh, and maybe cooking or, or the like. Um, Centurions uh, were also elected by their people, and once they were elected, they pretty much had absolute power and absolute control over you. So um, whatever they said, you did. Uh, the contraburnium is commanded by a tecanus, which is similar to a modern-day corporal. There's only eight of them, and what you would do with the contraburnium, this actually meant tent party. So these people on the march would share a tent. It would usually be a tent made of leather, They'd be given a mule to carry uh, their tent and some of their other supplies. Um, when they were garrisoned at a barracks, there would be uh, four to a room. Okay? And we can see here, this might be a tent uh, that a contraburium may share. So something like that. 
Um, some of the soldiers, the common soldier or infantryman was known as the Munifex. The hornblower that you see on the right here uh, with that circular trumpet, uh, that's a cornison. And these people are rather important because in the Roman times we don't have radios or cell phones, so you have to be able to give a signal somehow. So the centurion might be very close to, or the cornison may be close to the centurion, may ask for the signal to advance or retreat, and the cornison would trumpet it, and the Roman army would respond accordingly. This is going to be important later when we get to our battle tactics. Uh, the signifer is our standard bearer. And we can see one here. Uh, the standard bearer would carry the standard of, uh, of the legion or of the century. And we can see this one has a small shield. Um, since he had to hold up this standard, um, he was given the smaller shield. So he was a little bit more vulnerable. Uh, the signifer actually sometimes doubled as the banker uh, for the century. And he was given double pay. Um, additionally to all the things that we just saw, um, we have a lot of auxiliary troops for the Roman um, legion. One, each, each legion is given uh, some cavalry, so you will have some horsemen. Artillery, we talked about the Scorpio and the Onager. Um, you would have some bowmen, axemen, and slingers. Okay, so these were going to be important auxiliary troops that you may have. And different cohorts within the legion actually may have different functions. So you may have one that was specialized in missile weapons, such as bows and arrows and slings. Um, you'll have some musicians. You'll have some baggage handlers. You'll have some medical staff. Um, each legion was issued a finance officer. Um, because we have to remember that when Rome goes to conquer, um, they're going to be pretty much acquiring resources. So they're going to need a finance officer to take care of this. And there is a Roman navy as well that exists separate from the legion. All right, um, they have a three-line deployment. Now, you remember when we talked about the Greek um, phalanx? You had the phalanx and the hoplites that would skirmish around it. Well, the Romans are very similar, but much more complex. In the first line of attack, you would have the velites and the astadi. And if you can remember from earlier, asta meant spear, so astadi simply means spearmen. Um, the velites are similar to the Greek hoplites. They would kind of go around and skirmish. And what they would do is they would run in front of the astadi, and they would attack the enemy with their javelins, uh, pilums, any sorts of uh, throwing weapons. And then after their ammunition was spent, they would run behind the astadi and their big spears to protect them. And they would rearm and go and do it again. So they would harass the enemy. Well, by the time the enemy heavy infantry caught up, the Astadi would retreat, and they would retreat behind uh, the Principe, which will come up next. But the Astadi and the Velites, these are people that were not very rich, and they were often pretty young. They couldn't afford the weapons and armor, so they kind of got stuck on the front lines. So this is very similar to the Greek system. If you had money and you could afford the armor and the weapons, then you could be part of the Principe. If not, you were probably part of the Astadi or the Velites. The Principe, these are like the main body of soldiers. These are the people in their prime. Um, but the Roman military was very uh, mobile. So when the Astadi needed to retreat, the Principe would open a, a hole in the shield wall for them to get behind them. And then the Principe would go to work. Um, these soldiers are often uh, rich or maybe not rich, but well-to-do. They have the weapons and armor. They're in their prime, so they're strong men, and they're ready to work. The triari are the older veterans, so people have paid their dues. They have the heavy armor, but maybe they've seen too many winters. They're going to be in the final line. That line is not as mobile, so that line is more equivalent to the Greek phalanx. So you would fight in this three-line system in the Roman army. 